Didius Julianus is remembered for his notorious purchase of the Imperial Throne following the assassination of Pertinax, and that his short reign was characterised by ineptitude. But Didius Julianus had decades of experience of governing the Empire's provinces and leading its armies. On paper, he was well fitted to rule the Roman Empire, but the tragedy of Julianus was not so much the result of personal failings as of prevailing circumstances. Early life and career He was born Didius Severus Julianus on the 29th of January 133 AD into one of the most prominent families of Mediolanum in northern Italy. He was raised in Marcus Aurelius's mother, Domitia Lucilius's household, and during the early stages in his public career, he enjoyed considerable imperial favour. He was quaestor a year before he reached legal age. After his quaestorship, he attained the office of Aedile, and subsequently the office of Praetor, through the support of Marcus Aurelius, probably in the year 164. After his praetorship, he was selected to be the legate of the Legio 22 Primogenia, stationed in Mogontiacum. Following that, he was governor of Belgica, starting in the year 170. During his governorship, the Chalky tribe across the Rhine tried to invade Roman territory, but with auxiliaries hastily levied from the province, he held out against them. As a result, he was rewarded with a suffect consulship by Marcus Aurelius. His consular colleague was Pertinax. Then he was the governor of Dalmatia, where it is said he eliminated threats from the border tribes. Then he was sent to govern the important frontier province of Lower Germania, probably until the death of Marcus Aurelius. Shortly after Commodus's ascension, Didius was put in charge of the Alimenta in Italy, that is to say, in charge of donations to the poor in Italy. During this commission, one of his relatives was alleged to have been part of Lucilla's conspiracy in 182. Didius was a prominent figure in public life, so this potential connection could not be ignored, but after an investigation, he was acquitted of any charges. Nonetheless, Commodus wanted to remove Didius Julianus from the centre of politics, so he was sent into exile in his native city of Mediolanum. He was back in favour in the imperial court towards the end of Commodus's reign, and was assigned the proconsular province of Africa in 190 AD as the successor of Pertinax, who returned to Rome to serve as urban prefect. Didius Julianus was back in Rome for the festivities of New Year's Eve of 192, when Commodus was murdered by a group of conspirators seeking to end his erratic reign. He was succeeded by Pertinax, who only reigned for three months before being killed by his own disgruntled Praetorian guard, who wanted to return to the lax years of Commodus. The Auction of the Empire In 193, Didius Julianus was one of the leading members of the Senate at the time. His distinguished ancestry had by now been reinforced by a successful career under Marcus Aurelius, and the many governorships suggests that he was well qualified for the imperial throne. When Pertinax had been cut down by the Praetorian Guard, his father-in-law and the prefect of the city, Sulpicianus, was already in the Praetorian camp. He had been sent there by his son-in-law to set matters right in the camp. He obviously failed, but it was also an opportunity. He stayed in the camp, hoping to get himself appointed emperor. As soon as Didius Julianus heard of the murder of Pertinax, he rushed to the Praetorian camp to make his bid for the throne. When he came to the camp, he realised that Sulpicianus was already inside negotiating for the purple, and he was denied entrance into the camp. What followed was one of the most disgraceful episodes in Roman history. Full just as if it had been some market or auction room, both the city and its entire empire were auctioned off. The would-be buyers vied to outbid each other, one from the inside and the other from the outside of the camp. They gradually raised their bids up to 20,000 sesterces per soldier. Some of the soldiers would carry word to Julianus. Sulpicianus offers so much, how much more do you make it? 
and to Sulpicianus in turn, Julianus promises so much. How much do you raise him? Cassius Dio claims that Sulpicianus would have won the day until Julianus suddenly raised his bid by 5,000, and when he made references to the fact that Sulpicianus was the father-in-law to Pertinax, whom he might want to avenge at some point, he was welcomed into the camp. The Historia Augusta claims that Julianus wanted to restore the good name of Commodus. He won the bidding war and was proclaimed Emperor of Rome. Emperor. The Praetorians paraded their new emperor through the city towards the Senate House. Cassius Dio was present in the Senate that day, and he records an excerpt from the speech Julianus delivered. I see that you need a ruler, and I myself am best fitted of any to rule you. I should mention all the advantages I can offer, if you were not already familiar with them and had not already had experience of me. Consequently, I have not even asked to be attended here by many soldiers, but have come to you alone in order that you may ratify what has been given to me by them." Dio goes on. Though he actually surrounded the entire senate house outside with heavy armed troops and had a large number of soldiers in the chamber itself, moreover he reminded us of our knowledge of the kind of man he was, in consequence of which we both feared and hated him. The Senate confirmed his imperial status by granting him all the necessary powers, while the Senate had to swallow their pride and, as Dio said, mould our faces, so to speak, and posturing so that our grief could not be detected. The common people of Rome went about openly with sullen looks and spoke their minds. The following day, when Julianus was about to sacrifice to Janus before the entrance to the Senate, the people on the forum started shouting at him calling him a stealer of the empire and parricide. Julianus promised them some money, which made them resentful at the implication that they could be bribed, and all cried out together, We don't want it. We won't take it. When he heard their reply, he ordered the closest to be slain. That infuriated the populace all the more, and it did not cease expressing its regret for Pertinax and abusing Julianus invoking the gods and cursing the soldiers. But though many were wounded and killed in many parts of the city, they continued to resist. Finally, they seized arms and rushed together into the circus, and there spent the night and the following day without food or drink, shouting and calling upon the remainder of the soldiers, especially Pescenius Niger and his followers in Syria, to come to their aid. Later, exhausted by their shouting, by their fasting, and by their loss of sleep, they separated and kept quiet, awaiting the hoped-for deliverance from abroad. Dio records how Didius Julianus tried to court the favour of the Senate. Julianus managed affairs in a servile fashion, paying court to the Senate, as well as to all men of any influence. Now he would make promises, now bestow favours, and he laughed and jested with anybody and everybody. He was constantly resorting to the theatres, and kept getting up banquets. In fine, he left nothing undone to court our favour. The Three Revolts Whether Julianus's flattery was sincere or insincere was largely rendered irrelevant by the events in the provinces, as the armies of the empire were soon informed of Pertinax's murder and Julianus's disgraceful purchase of the empire. Claudius Albinus revolted with the three legions in Britain, Septimius Severus revolted with the Illyrian legions, and finally, Frescenius Niger revolted with the Syrian legions. Septimius Severus was the shrewdest of the three revolters, and he quickly realised that once Didius Julianus had been deposed, the would-be emperors would have to fight against each other. So Severus sent a letter to Albinus, appointing him Caesar and told him to stay put while he hastened to Rome. Pescanius, however, was too proud of having been summoned by the people. Severus had no chance of winning him over. In the face of Severus's advance, Julianus's position in Rome was more or less hopeless from the outset. He sent one of the Praetorian prefects, Tullius Crispinus, to secure the key naval base at Ravenna, 
while Julianus tried to fortify the city of Rome and the imperial palace, Dio found his efforts inept and laughable. Tullius Crispinus failed to prevent Ravenna from falling into Severan hands, and now Rome lay open. Didius fell back on increasingly desperate measures. Offers were made to both Severus and Marcus Aurelius's old friend, general and brother-in-law, the old venerable Tiberius Claudius Pompeianus, to share the throne, but both rejected his offer. He ordered that the gladiators of Capua be armed, a sure sign of crisis. He urged the priestly colleges to set out together with the Senate to meet Severus and urge him to halt his march on Rome. The Senate, however, was by now in open contempt of their emperor, declined on the grounds that an emperor who could not defend himself by force of arms had no right to rule. In his final desperation, he turned to superstition and magical practices. He performed prophetic rituals, and Dio claims that he even turned to human sacrifice. However, human sacrifice would have been so offensive to Roman sentiment that it's difficult to believe Julianus would have risked alienating what little support he had left. All the while, Severus was approaching the city with a hostile army, but in spite of that, Didius Julianus accomplished nothing with his Praetorian troops, and the populace hated and laughed at him more and more every day. The Historia Augusta. But all his efforts were to no avail. Didius Julianus had been deserted by virtually everyone, except for one of the Praetorian prefects and his son-in-law. As Septimius came closer to the city, we thereupon sentenced Julianus to death, named Severus Emperor, and bestowed divine honours on Pertinax. And so it came about that Julianus was slain as he was reclining in the palace itself. His only words were, But what evil have I done? Whom have I killed? Cassius Dio. Didius Julianus was 60 years old when he died. He ruled the empire for only 66 days. Final Thoughts Didius Julianus never had a fair chance of actually ruling the empire. He came to the throne in difficult times. Following the tragic murder of Pertinax, his killers were enriched and rewarded for their deed. The hatred and resentment towards the Praetorians would inevitably encompass the man whom they proclaimed emperor. As a result, our sources are very hostile towards Didius Julianus, but I think it's only fair that we evaluate those sources. Cassius Dio was a contemporary of Didius, and a fellow senator, and Dio openly admits to being biased against him, and apparently they had come into conflict with each other in the law courts. Whereas he had received favours from Pertinax, his account is sometimes maliciously inaccurate. Another source is the infamous Historia Augusta, which is more favourable towards Didius Julianus, and it's been theorised that the Historia Augusta's account is derived from an account written by a member of Didius's family in the 3rd century that sought to counter the charges against him. Another source is Herodian. His account is full of rhetorical moralising, and it seems that it distorted subsequent events. At the same time, Severan propaganda would have set out to discredit Didius in order to justify and legitimise Septimius Severus's own usurpation, so the historical account is muddled. Thanks for watching the video. Remember to like and subscribe to the channel to not miss any of our future uploads. The next video in this series will be on Septimius Severus.